is the day the Lord hath made. May we should rejoice and be glad in it. It's always a great day when the people of God come to the house of God to worship Him and to lift up the name of Jesus. And we are very, very glad that you're here this morning. And uh, especially those of you who are our guests, we're just we're very glad that you have come. You've come to a great place, a great church. So we're grateful that you're here in our presence. children too. You love them. Encourage them. Lift their spirits. Be back with them. Keep them there at the present time. I pray that pray that you give them strength and knowledge that can come only from you. Bless them. Bless the ministry. Bless the technicians. Bless everybody who has a part in the rendering aid to minister. I pray you bless them. Just, just lift up and encourage them. Is you're here in your house. Nobody else can be like that. You 
know the tiny little bit. Yes, <coughs> bless you workers in spirits each day. I pray you continue to bless them. I pray that uh, when this day will have ended, you would give victorious news that, that they have been rescued completely. We just give you the honor and glory and praise. Bless each one of your children. It's just a, it's just a good time to be in your house. Thank you for our guests who come to worship with us. We remember a special blessing from them. And I pray that I don't pray for my country. Thank you for this meeting. We can honor you and honor our country. I thank you for Larry. I'm proud to be an American. And I'm happy with what I see going on. We just put all of that before you this morning. I pray you guide those that lead us. Give them wisdom that can come only from God. Just lead us and guide us and direct us. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just praise the Lord. So let's sing together.
show as we get ready for our offering, we're going to sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. There are four verses, we'll do all four, and then after that we'll have our morning offering. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight says the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, let us give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. Let us remember that the things of this earth are passing things as the eternity lies with you. Father, we have the opportunity to open our hearts and our pocketbooks to you. Let us do not give begrudgingly, but let us be cheerful givers as we return to you a portion of that which you've given to us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
fortunate this morning that uh, the Taylor family is here to play for us during our this time of our service, and uh, we're always grateful and appreciative when they're able to do that. But uh, of course, send the big check because uh, they're getting ready to play for us, and so we look forward to hearing them uh, worship with us this morning.
Ukraine, the Maasai retreat. I've known them for uh, almost 20 years now. I watched Daniel grow up, and uh, as I stand a young man, he's read the University of South Carolina. For those of you who are not familiar with that, it is Clemson University. in South Carolina, but we work all over the state, so we just appreciate you all very much. Thank you for being a part of our, uh, our fellowship, and uh, I want to buy again and subscribe to the Thomas Kent because uh, there are so many names on the prayer list, we need to continue to make progress in this ministry. Francis Duncan just made a Father, we, we just privileged to be here this morning. I am privileged. Mom and I thank you every day, every single day. And we have been so surely blessed, blessed by you. Another blessing. Pray the recovery, Father, is going to be quicker. Thank you, Miss Francis, has been able to go and spend some days and weeks, perhaps, with her son and her continued recovery. Look forward to Miss Ruby being released from Westminster real soon. I pray for those who are going through crisis. I know there's some, Father, that haven't spoken to prayer. are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Angels beckon us to heaven's open door and we can't see your home in this world anymore. That's okay. God will bring us a son, but this world's not the end. But when we leave here, it's only the beginning of a much, much better life. We thank you for the assurance that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for Thomas. We thank you that you placed call us in his life and he's listened and he's following you in obedience. We pray that you, you will continue to guide him and bless him, particularly as he goes to, to southern Richmond. And we give you the wisdom. We give him all the assets that he needs. Have him set to a great ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I know he's going to present the gospel this morning. He has every time his children have said. And I pray the Holy Spirit would just anoint him this morning and he would preach in such a way that, that there's somebody here today who's never, ever received Christ into their life. They would be that great moment of decision. <coughs> Help us as we lift up Jesus this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been some years since uh, a young man from William Hall several times and I said uh, some weeks ago that uh, I believe that uh, as a pastor it's my responsibility it's my blessing to be able to afford a young man such as Thomas who has been called into the ministry and give him opportunity to preach and our pastor did not do that today thank God I had another mentor who came alongside of me and I always remember him and so I, I want to encourage 
part of our church in the Thomas Lady Loving with two cities. And uh, you know, Thomas, when you become pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, you remember me. I appreciate it. Would you uh, go ahead and take your Bibles out and turn with me over to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13. All right, while you're doing that, I'm going to tell you a brief introductory story. So this fall at PC, um, I had a social media marketing class with a girl from Germany. Now, she was a foreign exchange student. And she sat beside me, and she would always uh, have me to answer some questions for her, help me to explain stuff to her, because honestly, the language barrier was a little bit difficult for her, and I didn't mind that at all. That wasn't a problem. But one day, we come into class, and we're getting some tests back. They're the first test we've had in that class all semester. So she gets hers back, and it is immediately obvious that she is disappointed with her grade, and she seems super confused as to why she's gotten a bad grade. Now, I wasn't shocked because, like I said, she was a foreign exchange student. And while she spoke decent English, like good enough to work her way through a conversation, good enough to get by in class, good enough to get by in America, uh, when it comes to sitting in class and getting notes in your second language and having to memorize that and having to give the information back in your second language, that has to be really hard. I've taken like five semesters of Spanish between high school and college, and if I walked into a business class in Spain right now, I'd be absolutely lost. It would be... No bueno. That's about how much Spanish I remember. Um, so I thought it was a very real possibility that her English just wasn't as proficient as it needed to be to do really well on the test. I'm sorry, we're in Filbert. Let's me, let me translate that for you. She weren't real good at speaking American. That's, <laughs> that, she wasn't good at it. So as it turns out, that wasn't the problem at all, though. The language had nothing to do with it. Um, we start going over the test, the teacher's up the front, he's reading out the questions and calling out the answers, and about three questions in, he reads one off and gives the answer, and she says, yeah, but I put that. So here comes the professor over to her, and he looks at her test, and he walks over and he says, yeah, well, you did put B, but you also put A and D, and you did it on like seven questions. And she says, well, you didn't say, we only had to pick one answer. <laughs> I, I will say that was true, I'll admit he did not say that, but we all know he didn't have to. Because a lot of times on multiple choice tests, answer choices are mutually exclusive. Meaning that if you think that one of the answer choices is true, then the other ones must be false. So for example, I said that was a social media marketing class. Let's just say one of the questions was how many times a day should a business make a post on Facebook? You got the answer choices. A, less than one time daily. B, one time daily. C, three to four times daily. Or D, five to six times daily. Now, let's just say the right answer is three to four times daily. It actually is, by the way. So if you say that's the answer, you can't circle C three to four times daily and also circle A less than once daily. Because if posting three times a day is the right answer, then you can't say, well, not posting ever on one day is the right answer. They can't both be true. Now, that's just the nature of that question. And that's just the nature of those answer choices. But the question I'm asking today works in a very, very similar manner. You see, you've got to circle one of the choices provided, and when you do, you're saying that you think that one answer is correct and the other ones are incorrect. I'll tell you from the get-go that the question we're going to look at today, there is only one answer that you can circle. And it's not really my question as much as it's the Scripture's question. You can't look into the text that we're going to look at without hearing it cry out to you the question. The question is... What type of soil are you? Let's read the text. Matthew 13, starting in verse 1. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down, while the whole crowd stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the parable of the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seeds fell on good ground and produced fruit, 
Some 100, some 60, some 30 times what was sown. Let anyone who has ears listen. Now, let's jump over to verse 18 where Jesus explains this parable. So listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. And the one sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root and is short-lived. When stress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. Now the one who's sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But the one sown on the good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word, who, who does produce fruit, and yields some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity before us today. I thank you that I'm sitting here and there's the word that you gave us in my language for me to read, for me to be able to understand. God, that's a gift. God, not everybody enjoys that gift. Help us to be grateful for that. Dear Lord, as we come to this portion of the service where we look at your word, where your word's preached, God, I just pray that, that you would would not let anything that I've said be heard, but God, your Holy Spirit would speak through me and that you would convey the message that you've laid on my heart this week. God, be with us in all things, and I pray that you would show someone more of yourself this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, now let's go back up. Uh, we're going to start in verse 18 and 19 and work our way through this passage. So listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. Now, something that you're going to see from all four soil types this morning is that the Bible says that every one of them hears. The word of God or the word about the kingdom, as the text calls it, passes through every person's ears. Because when I talk, my vocal cords produce a vibration. It leaves my mouth in sound waves, makes its way to your ear. Your ear canal transmits that to your brain, and your brain decodes it into an information that you can understand. You can't avoid that. Everybody hears. I would like to look at Romans 10 real quick. Oh, I have not been clicking at all, Travis. Have you been helping me out? There you go. Thank you. Romans 10. I'm going to start in verse 14. How then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But on all who obey the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. So Paul says it seems like they've all heard the gospel, but not everyone has obeyed the gospel. And Paul references where Isaiah asked God, Lord, who has believed our message? Paul is saying, it, doesn't, it seems like it doesn't make sense, because if faith comes from hearing and hearing comes from the gospel, then they should all be obedient to the gospel. So then he asks, well, did they not hear? And he answers, yes, they did. He says their voice has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the end of the world. That leads him to his next point. He says, but I ask, did Israel not understand? He goes on to explain how Israel did not understand. Now, the problem that Paul's speaking about in Romans chapter 10 is exactly what we're facing here in Matthew 13. The people are hearing. The gospel is being proclaimed. The words are passing through people's heads. The problem is that people aren't making it to understanding. So, what is understanding then? Um, let's look at... Psalm 119, verse 144, quickly. David writes, he says, Your decrees are righteous forever. Give me understanding, and I will live. So David declares in that text that understanding is what leads to life. Now, in the text we're looking at today in Matthew 13, it's going to go on to claim that understanding is what leads to life. I want you to think about John 3.16 real quickly. What are we told leads to life? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, for whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 says that belief leads to life. Some of my favorite verses in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 says that faith is what leads to life. 
And he goes on to explain that faith is not something that you produce in and of yourself, but it is the gift of God. In a very similar way, in, in Psalm 119, 144, we see that David says the understanding, the understanding he needs to obtain life is a gift from God. So I think it's safe to say that there is a connection between understanding, between faith, and between belief. So I want you to think again about John 3.16. I'm sure that every person in here could quote it. And I'm sure that we could all agree that it clearly says that belief is what leads to eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for whosoever believe. But what does that word believe mean? I think this is where the rubber meets the road. I think this is where we get to the heart of our text this morning. What is belief? The definition for the original Greek word, as is used in John 3.16, pronounced pistuo, is to have faith directed unto believing, or in faith to give oneself up. You see, the word believe in John 3.16 does not merely mean that you think Jesus existed, and that you think Jesus died, and that you think Jesus was resurrected. It's not impressive to say that you believe that. It's not a challenge to be able to see those things. I referenced this just the other week. You see, Josephus, the great Jewish historian, Tacitus, the great Roman historian, even the Jewish Talmud, all say that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person, that he walked the earth, and he was crucified under Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. All three of those documents were written by men who were not Christians, who did not believe in Jesus, but they affirm exactly what the Bible says. What about the resurrection? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes that there were more than 500 people who had seen Jesus after he'd been resurrected. He says, now some of them have died, but most of them are still here. Most of them are still right here. I'll be happy to testify about what they've seen. Now, given the context of who Jesus was, how important his message has been, you can't put that in writing if it's not true. You can't say, I've got 500 eyewitnesses, if you can't back that up. Now, what about Paul himself? See, he claimed he had seen the risen Jesus, but he did a whole lot more than claim it. In the early 60s, the Jews had arrested him for his leadership role in Christianity. And then in the mid-60s, he was taken to Rome to stand trial before Nero. At that trial, he was sentenced to die a martyr's death. And as a result, he was led outside where he got down on his knees and he hung his head. And a Roman soldier stood over him with a sword and cut his head off his body. Now, You want to tell me that that man wasn't 100% sure that Jesus Christ was alive? So, what does it matter that you think Jesus was a real person? Because that's a historical fact. Rational people don't dispute that. It's not significant that you're convinced of Jesus' crucifixion. Once again, that's a historical fact. People don't dispute that. Who do you think is impressed that you think Jesus was resurrected? Because when you look at the evidence, there is no plausible alternative. The resurrection of Jesus fits the facts of the situation better than any other imaginable explanation. So the fact that you believe certain things about Jesus to be historically true is not what belief means in John 3.16. No, John 3.16 says that belief is the ability in faith to give oneself up. Say, Jesus, I surrender. Jesus, you can have my life. Jesus, I acknowledge your lordship over my life and I submit myself to you. That's belief. That's what understanding is. That's what faith is, and that alone is salvation. Now, I want us to look at the next type of soil. I'll read verses 20 and 21 to you. It says, in the one sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root, and it is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. Now, I think we can all relate to this soil in some form or fashion because we've all been way more excited about something than we realized we should have been. Maybe not spiritually, but it's happened in some aspect of our lives. Now, one thing that comes to my mind when I think about that is college football. Playing college football had been my dream since I was like eight years old, and that was around the same time that I became a huge Clemson fan for no apparent reason. So naturally, growing up, I always wanted to play football at Clemson. But the problem is, if you want to be an offensive lineman at Clemson, you need to be about six foot three, you need about, about 285 pounds or heavier, and all that needs to be made out of muscle. Um, 
You, you also need to be really fast, really coordinated, really agile. And in a general sense, when you walk on a football field, you need to look like a grown man playing against a bunch of boys. So I take a look at myself in high school, and I see very clearly that I possess absolutely zero of these characteristics. <laughs> so my senior year rolls around, and I decide that I'm going to go play at PC. Now, when it comes to football, PC is no Clemson. But I was excited nonetheless. I mean, I was still... About to get play college football, that had been my dream. I thought that was pretty cool. But it did not take me very long to realize that I'd made some serious miscalculations about what playing college football was going to be like. Um, I get to school, and I, I was getting to enjoy all the, the responsibilities of being a freshman, the greatest of which was playing scout team offensive line. Now, if you're not very familiar with what scout team offensive line means, I can simplify that for you. I was a living, breathing, blocking dummy. So <laughs> the, first, the first Saturday practice that I ever had to participate in was right after our team had gotten back from playing a Thursday night money game in Northern Illinois. Now, Northern Illinois is a pretty decent Division I school. The year before we played them, they actually had a quarterback who was a finalist for the Heisman Trophy, one of the best players in college football that year. So it's safe to say they had a lot of talent, at least much more talent than the mighty, mighty Blue Hose. Um, that, that's our mascot. I know nobody knows what that is, but it's okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, so like I said, it was a money game. So they, they essentially had paid us to come up there and get beat, and that is exactly what happened. Um, it ended up being like 55 to 3. So our team comes back on Friday, and I've been at school the whole time. I didn't get to travel. A bunch of the freshmen didn't get to travel. So everybody had Friday off, and then we we're going to have practice Saturday morning. Now, it's the end of August, so it's nice and warm out there. And we get out to the field, and the coaches were absolutely livid. Now, everybody had expected we were going to lose. That didn't surprise anybody. But the coaches were very disappointed in our effort or lack thereof. So what happened is they ran us like half the morning, and every time somebody would screw something up, I mean anything up, they would stop the whole team. Everybody on the field just stop, just start doing up downs. So it was pretty miserable out there in the August heat, but I was surviving it. Now, at this point, I've made it almost to the end of practice. There's one more individual period left, and somebody from the defensive line hollers over, and they say, hey, we need that scout team offensive line. So we drag ourselves over there, and they get us in the huddle, and they say, all right, we've got about 10 minutes to run inside drill. Now, they did not have to tell me what inside drill was. I knew what inside drill was. Inside drill, essentially the offensive line block and run plays against the defensive line and the linebackers. But instead of it being an even matchup this time, it's the human blocking dummies versus the best players that we have on the team. So we're just out there getting absolutely obliterated, and nobody cares at all. The guy they've got coaching us is just like, y'all are doing a great job. Y'all are making us better. And we're just like, thanks, coach. So glad to be of service to you, coach. <laughs> so defensive line coach finally, finally hollers over and says, all right, last play. Run one more play. We're going to wrap it up. So we get in the huddle to see what we got to run. Defensive line coach speaks up again. He says, coach, get them to run card number 11. So he flips his notebook over to card 11. I mean, card number, yeah, 11. And he holds it up, and he says, all right, here's what y'all got to do. Shows us the play. The play was trap left. Now, I'm playing right guard, and what that means is that I'm the guy that has to pull. I've got the key block. If the play has a chance of working, I've got to do my job. So we come walking up to the line. Defensive line coach hollers out again. He says, Derek. Now, Derek was our about 6'3-ish, about 350, 340 pound-ish guy at the time. He squatted well over 500. He benched over 400. Now, if you're not good with numbers, Derek was really big and Derek was really strong. That's what that means. So uh, he says, Derek, if they run trap left right here, what do you mean if they run trap left? You're the one that just called the play. You just told us what to run. Everybody on the field knows we're about to run trap left. You're not going to surprise anybody. So he said, Derek, if they run trap left right here and you don't blow it up, you've got a 300-yard shuttle after practice. Now, I will give you one guess as to who I was supposed to block on that play. <laughs> so I go up to the line and I get my stance. I'm thinking, Thomas, this is your opportunity, man. Like, this is your chance to show them you came down here to play some football. This is your opportunity to show them you're here and you mean business. And this might be your opportunity to start making your way off scout team, which is what I was really motivated by. So I go up the line. Now I'm in my stance. About the time I conclude my little mental pep talk, center snaps the ball. I take my 45-degree trap step. I push off my right foot. I'm on a good track, and I'm coming downhill at this dude. Center clears, goes to block down on the nose guard, and as soon as he clears, the only thing I see is the top of Derek's helmet. 
and it's coming straight at my face mask. And when I say I took it square in the face, I mean I took it square in the face. It was the hardest I'd ever been hit in my whole entire life. That dude absolutely planted me. So, so here come my little scout team buddies to help me up off the ground. Hey, man, you all right? I mean, they thought he killed me. I kind of thought he might have killed me. But I didn't. He didn't kill me, and I survived. I made it back to the locker room. And about the time I'm pretty much done changing back into my clothes, here comes my buddy Lawrence. Now, for those of y'all who don't know Lawrence, me and Lawrence have been like best friends since seventh grade, pretty much inseparable all throughout high school. And when we graduated, he decided he was going to go play football at PC for a little while too. So he walks in the locker room. He is all out of breath. And I said, man, what have you been doing? He said, we were out there running. I said, why? He said, well, coach has said the defense didn't, didn't feel like doing anything on Thursday night, so we was going to do something this morning. I said, uh, man, I hate that. He said, oh, you hate it. I said, he, he said, the worst part is that the guys who played on Thursday night, they made them sit on the sideline so they could get their legs back up under them, while the guys that didn't play and the guys that didn't even travel had to run. And I laughed a little bit, and I said, that's kind of messed up, man. And he, he finally gets around. He says, how did your practice go, Thomas? And I said, Lawrence, I said, I got hit so hard. I said, my head hurts so bad right now. So I started telling the whole story. And he says, man, I hate to hear that. I said, I hate to tell it. I said, but, you know, we got the rest of the day off. We don't have anything to do till tomorrow afternoon. I said, what do you want to do? Now, this is the first weekend I've ever been at college. The first weekend we had been there, uh, first whole weekend we've ever spent at college. And he said, he said, I don't care what you got in mind. I said, oh, not a whole lot. And we stood there in silence for about 15, 20 seconds. And he said, you want to go home? I said, I'll meet you in the truck. I will be there. And... <laughs> It was right then at that moment where I realized that I had officially gotten over the excitement of playing college football. <laughs> so how does that relate? And the one who was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, but he has no root and is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. Just like I got over the excitement of playing college football, the Bible says that there are some people who have gotten over the excitement of an encounter with the gospel. You can tell that they had an encounter because there was an initial action. They received it with joy. It says they received the word immediately. They certainly had some sort of encounter with the gospel. Now, maybe they heard a watered-down version of the gospel. One that says, you just didn't care how you live. You just didn't care what you do. You just didn't care what you do with your time. You just didn't care what you spend your money on. You didn't care what you watch on TV. You didn't care what you drink. You didn't care what parties you go to. That's a very real possibility because that is a very popular message in America today. Or maybe all they were told was, just come as you are, come as you are, come as you are. And they never heard the part about, and submit your life to Christ. They never heard that though their previous life was defined by sin, they had now been commissioned to wage war against the sin in their lives. Maybe all they were told was, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. And they never considered what it cost God to show that love. They were never told that Jesus has commanded that we love him in return. They were never told that Jesus demands our obedience. Maybe, maybe they walked the aisle. Maybe they made a public profession of faith. Maybe they joined a church. Maybe they were baptized. But make no mistake about it, the Bible plainly says they were not saved. They didn't understand. It says that they fell away. Now, when you understand that the very being who created the universe, the Bible says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. All things were created through Him, and without Him was not anything made that has been made. When you truly understand the very being who created the universe took up a human body and came down here and walked on this earth for the explicit purpose of shedding His blood so that He could be the perfect sacrifice so that you might have a relationship with God, you don't get over that. Jesus never gets old to you. Jesus never becomes a burden for you. What can hard times do to you? What can persecution do to you? What can distress do to you? Paul says our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. When you have saving faith in Jesus Christ, nothing in this world can cause you to get over that. Now, the next type of soil is very similar to that which was planted on the rocky ground, but it proves unfruitful for different reasons. Now, the one who was sown among the thorns, this is one who hears the word, but the words of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. 
I want you to notice again that this group of people also hears the word, and once again, the only thing missing is understanding. The seed was planted, the seed that was planted on the rocky ground, it lacked roots and it fell away immediately. But the seed that was planted among the thorns, it apparently took root because it began to grow. The problem with this seed wasn't that the soil wasn't fertile. The problem with this seed was actually that the soil was too fertile. As, as the seed began to grow, so did other things. The text refers to them as thorns. It specifically cites the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth. What is a worry of this age? I think a worry of this age is anything that has the potential to disrupt our focus, to distract us from our walk with Christ, because nothing that does that is a good thing. The Bible uses the word thorns for a good reason. Nobody likes thorns. I know we got a bunch of outdoorsmen here, but I bet now y'all have ever been walking in the woods and said, man, I'm so glad to see these thorns everywhere. It just really shows nature's doing great. I bet you've never been down on your hands and knees tracking a deer and been like, man, I'm glad I've got briars in my clothes. I'm glad there's a thorn in my hand. I've just been craving something to have to dig out of my palm lately. People don't do that. Everybody understands that thorns are a bad thing. Everybody agrees on that, but many people aren't cautious enough to keep the thorns from growing in their spiritual life. You say, now, Thomas, you really think that people can respond to the gospel with good intentions? And because of the thorns in their life, they can end up just as lost as they were in the first place. Yeah, I do. I do because the Bible says that. I do because I've watched it happen. In my ministry at PC, I was fortunate enough to see a lot of guys take interest in the gospel. I watched a lot of those same guys lose interest in the gospel. Sorry, man. Not going to be at Bible study tonight. Got something to do with the fraternity house. Hey, man, didn't get a lot of sleep last night. Not going to be able to meet with you. And yeah, Satan does have a knack for getting college guys tied up with alcohol and with substances and with chasing the wrong type of women. But I promise you that nobody is immune to thorns growing in their life. And what about the deceitfulness of wealth? Well, you don't have to listen to Jesus talk for very long to understand that his definition of success and the world's definition of success are two very, very different things. Now, I don't see where the Bible says there's anything wrong with having a nice car- house or having a nice car or going on vacation every now and then. Because the Bible doesn't say that the gospel is choked out by wealth. The Bible says that the gospel is choked out by the deceitfulness of wealth. When you start thinking that you can fix the problems in your life by obtaining more stuff, you're being deceived. When you start thinking that more money is going to lead to more joy, you're being deceived. If you think that God's impressed with the dollar value of what you give to him, you're being deceived. In Mark chapter 12, and I just referenced this story a few weeks ago. Travis, uh, it's on there somewhere. I hope you're keeping up. I haven't picked up this clicker in like 20 minutes. So. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus and his disciples are sitting outside the temple. And they're watching people put money into the treasury. Now, when you put money into the treasury in the first century, you did it by placing it into a trumpet-shaped bronze funnel that put the money under the temple and when you put money into that funnel it made a very distinct very noticeable noise when it was struck by a coin so here comes rich person after rich person they're walking up they're dumping in their money literally by the bag and the bible does not record that jesus had anything to say about it now here comes a widow who drops in two coins the two coins she had were of very little monetary value worth about two dollars in our society today And all of a sudden, Jesus, who's been silent the whole time that the rich people have been pouring in their money into their offering box, he sees the widow, and he speaks up, and he says, hey, boys, look at that. The disciples see the widow dropping in two coins, and surely they were confused, or maybe they even thought Jesus was going to say something about the amount she had put in. But he didn't. He says, she has put more into the treasury than all the others, for they all gave out of their surplus. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. See, the rich people had given much money and everybody knew it. They'd been, stand waiting, they'd been seen standing in line with their money bags and every coin that they deposited into that funnel was heard by the crowd. But they didn't draw one remark out of Jesus. But the lady that laid down her pride and waited in that long, long line of rich people with two coins in her hand that made a measly tink tink when she dropped them into the funnel, she got God Almighty to turn his head and say, look at that. You see, God isn't impressed with the dollar value of your offering. And when it comes to your life, giving God a lot of it isn't enough. 
See, he demands to be Lord over all. Either he's the Lord over all, or he's not your Lord at all. And I think that if you, if you think that Jesus is willing to be your Savior when you haven't been willing to make him Lord, you got another thing coming. Now, we've arrived at the final type of soil. Verse 23, but the one who is sown on the good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word, who does produce fruit, and yields some 100, some 60, some 30 times what was sown. This is the only soil type that allows the gospel to bear fruit. This is the only one that hears and also manages to understand. And while we've seen that other soil types do respond, the good soil is the only time that responds with understanding. The good soul is the only one that can respond with the faith that it takes to give oneself up. The faith that it takes to say, Jesus, I surrender, you're going to have it all. Now, this soul might still have some rocks in it, and it might still have some thorns laying around, but nothing in the good soul can keep the good soul from producing fruit. The Bible says that some will produce hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Not all of Christ's servants are going to take the same form. Not all of Christ's servants are going to do the same work. But make no mistake about it, all of Christ's servants are going to produce fruit. All will bear evidence of their life-changing faith. See, Jesus didn't say to his followers, you've got the option to be a light. you got the opportunity to be a light. He said, you are the light of this world. He didn't say, you've got the chance to fish for men. You might enjoy fishing for men. He said, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. He didn't say, now, listen here, disciples, your obedience is optional. He didn't say, follow me for however long you want to, and I'll just call it good enough. He said, if, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You see, Jesus was well aware this world will be full of people who claim to be his followers who actually had no relationship with him. That's why he gave us this text that we've looked at today. You can't read this passage in Matthew 13 without having the text cry out, what kind of soil are you? So the time has come for you to answer that question. And maybe you can honestly say, yes, I have heard. Yes, I have understood. Yes, I've surrendered my heart to Jesus. He's the one on the throne of my heart. Or maybe you say, well, I've definitely heard the gospel. And I think that I've understood and I'm pretty sure that I've surrendered my life to Jesus, and I feel like he's the one calling, my shot, calling the shots in my life. If you want clarity about that, all you have to do is look at your fruit. Are you a light in this dark world? Because Jesus says Christians will be. Are you a fisher of men? Because Jesus says that his followers are. Do you obey the commands of Jesus? Because Jesus says that his disciples do. Now, maybe you're sitting here and you say, oh, well, I've definitely heard the gospel, and I have responded before. But if I were to be honest, it was pretty short-lived. Things got tough and life got busy and the gospel just stopped making an impact on my life. If that's you, then you've got a problem. Because when you truly understand who Jesus is, what he's done for you, and how that impacts your life, you don't simply get over that. Maybe you say, yeah, I've heard and I've responded to the gospel, but the gospel had a lot of competition in my life. And truth be told... There were some other things that I really loved and couldn't seem to let go of, and they kept the gospel from transforming my life. Now, if that's you, once again, you've got a problem. Because when you truly understand who Jesus is, what he's done for you, and what impact that has on your life, there is nothing that can successfully compete with that. If you truly understand the gospel, it's not a challenge for you to say, Jesus, I surrender. Jesus, take it all. Jesus, I'm putting my trust in you. So, Whoever you are, wherever you're at spiritually, now is your time to respond. If there's a burden on your heart, you need to pray about it. You know some people who you say they're not in good soil. This is like a good place to to hash that out. What I'm really concerned about is if the Holy Spirit of God's moved in your heart and shown you that you need a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus, I would urge you to respond to that. You say, well, I don't really know how to respond to that. That's okay. Let me help you. I'm going to pray, we're going to sing a song, I'm going to be standing right down here, I'm going to be absolutely ready to have a conversation with anyone who needs to do business with God. I would urge you to do so if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today. Let me pray. God, once again we thank you for this opportunity, we thank you for this time to be in your house. 
we've, we've passed the portion where your word has been preached, and we've arrived at the portion where we have to make a decision. We've got to make a decision as who's going to be on the throne of our life when we walk out of here. Is it going to be us? Is it going to be our sinful human selves? Or is it going to be the God of the universe? That's the question. That's the decision that we're left to make. God, I thank you for this text, and I thank you for how it challenges us, how it calls out and says, what type of soul are you? God, there are people in this room who need to answer that question. None of us are above being asked that question. And God, I just pray that you would give us eyes to see where we truly stand with you and a heart that can respond in an appropriate manner. Jesus, it's in your name I pray, ask all these things. And it's to your will that I bend all these requests. In Jesus' name, amen.
do predict that if Thomas continues on the course that he is on, he holds fast to this word. The Bible is, and Thomas believes this, the Bible is the infallible, error word of God. Truth without any mixture of error. Uh, he believes that. Uh, I appreciate you, Thomas. The road ahead is not easy for Thomas or anyone who's preaching the gospel today. I remember a time when a man would preach a gospel message, clear-cut presentation of the gospel. In a crowd this size, the altar would literally be filled with people. We have fallen on the worst times the church could possibly fall on. One of the most, uh, one of the best known preachers in America, I heard him on television the other day. He said the church is in the worst spiritual state it's been since the Reformation. I'm not sure I totally agree with that I agree it's in the worst spiritual state it's been in. I can tell you this much. I wasn't here during the Reformation. <laughs> but I can tell you this much. The church is in the worst spiritual state. It's been in since I entered the ministry 56 years ago. I'm telling you. Dr. Al Mohler, and I Reference this to Thomas the other day. Dr. Al Mohler is president of Southern Seminary. He is probably one of the greatest spokesmen Southern Baptists have. Solid as a rock when it comes to belief. Dr. Al Mohler said this week, or it's two weeks ago, that if you get the Baptist Courier, it was in the Baptist Courier, the July edition of the Baptist Courier. <clears throat> Dr. Al Mohler, highly respected. He appears on, uh, when there's some controversy about morals, Dr. Al Mohler is one of the first persons they called from the Christian perspective to give, a, give an opinion. Dr. Al Mohler said in the July issue of our Baptist Courier, Dr. Mohler said basically what the other person said, but he added this. Southern Baptists, some of you aren't Baptists, shame on you. <laughs> I was taking my groceries out to the old A&P store in Rock Hill many years ago, and he, I've always dressed like this. Uh, I'm just from the old school. And he thought I was an insurance salesman. He said, you're an insurance salesman. Well, I am selling insurance in a way. <laughs> We're selling fire insurance against hell. If you want to subscribe today, Thomas and I'll write you policy. Uh, I said, no, sir, I'm not. I said, I'm a preacher. He said, what kind of preacher are you? I said, well, I'm Baptist. He said, well, you know, if I wasn't Baptist, what I'd be in? I said, no, sir, I don't know. He said, I'd be ashamed of myself. <laughs> well, I'm Baptist born, Baptist bred. When I die, I'll be Baptist dead. No, there's some, uh, some good Methodists, they RP people here, uh, some good Pentecostal people. But Moeller said that this just, I don't know what it did to me. Al Mohler said, the judgment of God has fallen on the Southern Baptist Convention. Al Mohler said that. Now, if I say that, you can say, oh, Al Mohler says that. You better, you better pay attention to it. Most are preaching a, a watered-down gospel of Thomas has preached the pure, unadulterated gospel of Jesus. And if you aren't saved, I wouldn't waste another day getting excited. Because I believe Jesus is coming back. Very, very, very soon. I told the funeral director the other day, I'm not looking for you. I'm looking for the other folks. And so they come here, young lady. Ain't she pretty this morning? <laughs> She's going to be here Wednesday night speaking for us. She is from Kenya. She speaks very, very good English. You do not want her to miss hearing her tell you Wednesday night about the ministry that she has in Kenya with the orphans. And there are literally thousands and thousands of orphans. People just literally discard them and put them on the street. 
And this is one of those dear lady, and she's staying with Joe and Crystal. She's going to speak with us tonight. Don't miss it. Uh, we're going to have a great supper with us tonight, Miss Pat. Yes, we are. Steak and ribs. Steak and ribs. And corn. And corn. <laughs> Good Lord, how could anybody miss that meal? Steak and, and, and ribs and corn. What else? All for three dollars. <laughs> you can't go to Jackson's cafeteria and get that for three dollars. It's gonna be a great meal. At six o'clock. Come in. Six and what a meal! And then this precious lady is gonna come and she's gonna share with us what God's doing in her ministry in Kenya, and she's gonna lead us in prayer this morning. Sure thing. God bless you, dear. So good to have you. sing our closing song as we end our service this morning. Let's just pray.